In the quest to build a catio to curb the curiosity of my little guy Wasabi and help him make friends with the neighborhood kitties, things took a few turns for the worse. But let's start at the beginning. Now, if you're not familiar with a catio, basically a catio is a covered patio, but for cats. It gives indoor cats an outlet to enjoy the outdoors without having free reign to wander off and get lost. The whole catio structure is going to be 4 feet by 8 feet and it's going to rest against the basement window of my house. It's a pretty big project size-wise, but it's also the first thing I've ever built by myself. From idea to design to completed project, so it's a pretty big deal in that sense too. I started off by cutting 2x4s to create the back frame of the structure. I'm using pressure treated wood here since this will be subject to the elements and I live in a pretty harsh Canadian climate, so I want it to have some longevity. I moved the first few pieces over to my brand new mobile work table, which you can see me build in my last video if you didn't catch it already. Wink wink, nudge nudge. I was obviously way too excited about putting this bench into use because I instantly made a mistake on the project. Luckily, I just needed to back out the screw and flip the board 90 degrees and I was back on track. With the two outer boards together, I was ready to attach the middle brace piece. So I grabbed my tape and even confidently pulled out my fancy fraction calculator to help me find center. Once I got it all put together though, I realized I did the calculations all wrong and that was definitely not the center, which you can see me realizing here. So I got to work removing the middle board, which turned out to be a huge struggle. The board itself came off just fine, but the screw was holding on for dear life. I tried using a scrap piece of wood to apply pressure against the screw, I tried hammering it out with the hammer my grandpa called the persuader, but even that couldn't make it budge. Eventually I had to cut my losses and just saw it right off because I couldn't think of another way to handle it. Once I stood the frame up, I realized it was a little bit wobbly, but I ended up coming up with a really simple solve using some offcuts. Here you can see that I made some simple corner braces that really added stability to the frame. Plus, I liked the look it added to the overall build. Next up was the front frame, which I built exactly the same way, but swapped the 2x4 posts for 4x4s. I'd never cut a 4x4 post before, so I ended up using the miter saw and just continually cutting as deep as I could and then flipping it over until I had cut all the way through. This might not be the best way to do it, but the cut came out clean, so I was happy. The real struggle with this one was actually just maneuvering the frame by myself. I got desperate enough to even try using rope to leverage it, which is totally something my grandpa would have done, but it really wasn't very successful, so I took a break until I had some help. When it came to actually attaching the back frame to the house, I had to get a little bit creative. I didn't want to put any holes in the vinyl siding in case I ever took this down, so instead I ended up using some support pieces on either side of the window and attached them with brackets against the window frame. With the support on the far side that wasn't against the window, I was able to drill up behind the vinyl and into the sheet of wood sitting behind the insulation. I 
I also came back and added a shim in the middle just to keep everything tight against the house. Once I stepped back, my dad mentioned the corner brace on the left was limiting fire escape from the basement, so I nixed it. Luckily, there were a few anchor points to the house at this point, so the frame was plenty sturdy without it. The next step was to add these side pieces that would attach the back and front frames together. As you can see, I still slip up with the drill every now and then, but my skills are definitely getting better. Now we didn't know it at this point, but this was going to be a problem and actually later gets removed from the whole build. Of course, we always had our trusty foreman overseeing our work and making sure we stayed on schedule. You can often see his little white tuft peeking out from behind the window. There was a lot of leveling that needed to happen with this project, but we can speed through this part. In hindsight, it probably would have been better to build this on level ground and then move it into position, especially when you see the headache it causes. But you live and you learn. You can see that I'm sporting my grandpa's old tool belt through a lot of this video, which came in super, super handy. That said, I struggle to even really call this a tool belt since it's definitely 95% wood glue and construction adhesive at this point. Moving along to the roof structure and the leveling issue really started to rear its head. That middle sideboard was throwing things off kilter, so this is where I actually removed it. Unfortunately, the real issue was on the right-hand side. All of the measurements were correct for what I had designed, but in order for the right front post to line up with the edge of the top roof beam, the post had to be knocked completely out of alignment. This problem was honestly a huge head scratcher and it took a couple of days to sort out the issue. I tried throwing some shims in, thinking maybe that would do something. I honestly don't really know where my head was at there, but obviously that didn't help. I didn't want to lose too much time getting stuck on that problem though, so we forged ahead with other parts of the build until we could figure out the leveling issue. Eventually, we realized that we shouldn't have secured the back frame to the house yet because that's what was throwing off level so much. It was a really simple fix once we figured it out, but it definitely gave us a run for our money. Once we got to the front piece of the roof, my cut was a bit off, so I took a handsaw and shaved it down. Then I just used a couple of 2x4s to create beams for the PVC roof panels to attach to. We decided to put the roof panels on with the grooves running side to side, largely since they were the exact size we needed if we ran them that way, and partly because they were already chipping and we were worried that if we cut them to run them front to back, we might end up doing a lot of damage. There is a slight pitch running side to side as well, so it still does a really good job of keeping the water from pooling on top. Luckily, no damage was done to the camera, so we were able to just dust it off and keep going. The last piece of the build was making a little sliding door to allow people to pass in and out. 
Originally, this was going to be a fully fledged door on hinges, but this method saved time, resources, and honestly just made more sense since we weren't going to use the door very often. Essentially, the door comprises two frames, one top one that's static, and the bottom one that's sandwiched between two tracks to allow it to slide up and down. At this point, our foreman was getting annoyed with how long everything was taking, so it was really time to put our heads down and finish this thing up. I laid some landscaping fabric and built out the other half of the door, only to find out I had misimagined it in my head, and I needed to make a few adjustments to allow it to open fully. This time, throwing in some shims was exactly what I needed to do. Since this is a fairly simple, rustic outdoor project, I don't mind the rough around the edges type look that comes from using shims. If this was a nicer, more put together project inside, I would have just recut the pieces. And with my own nod of approval, I put together the track for the sliding door and the end was in sight. I just needed to add the window mesh and pop in a fresh helping of mulch. And with the seal of approval from the neighborhood kitty, the foreman was finally allowed to check it out for himself. To be honest, I'm not too sure if my grandpa was a cat guy or not, but I do distinctly remember a conversation with him where he said that if reincarnation was a thing, he wanted to come back as a fat house cat. And if wasabi is any example, I can totally see why. I have some future plans to add some platforms and scratching posts to this space, but for now, Waz is happy to survey his kingdom from the tree stump, and I'm happy my first project was such a success.